Good morning. For those of you that are still visiting out in the foyer, Kathy, it's time to come in now. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> Welcome. It's good to see you here this morning on this beautiful spring day. Oh no, it's winter. Sorry, forgot. Oh, it's not winter yet? It's still only fall? <sighs> okay. Normally at this time of year, in this community, it's winter. Normally we've got snow and misery and stuff going on. So I'm loving this. It's awesome to see this weather, this warm weather. You know, I go out and stand on my deck at 11 o'clock at night and look at the stars and look at the moon. And, and I'm going, man, it's still 12, 13 degrees. I'm still out here in a t-shirt. This is amazing. You know? Oh, is that when it usually gets bad? Okay, well... Well, I'm just, I'm just very grateful for the weather right now, and I'm glad that uh, it, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. Anyways, it's good to see you here this morning. Let's just open our worship service in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into some announcements, and then we'll, uh, we'll sing some songs. Let's pray. Father God, we just uh, come before you this morning, Lord, just praising and worshiping your name for who you are. God, we just thank you that you are a, a good God, a God who who looks after us, a God who loves us unconditionally, a God who's always there. Lord, when we, when we look at creation around us, when we look at the beauty of nature, when we look at all of that, we are reminded of how powerful of a God you are, how big of a God you are, and yet you want a relationship with me. You want that relationship with each one of us individually. God, you've created this universe, you've created this mass place, and yet you're concerned about each one of us individually. That's an amazing thing to think of. God, we just thank you that we can come here this morning, that we can worship you, that we can gather as a family. And God, that this is a family, that we care for each other. We, we are concerned about each other. We, we are accountable to each other, Lord. And we are so grateful that you've, you've given us that opportunity to be able to gather here and do that. And God, as we come to worship you here this morning, Lord, just help us to focus on you. Help us to put you at the center of our lives. Help us to just know that you are God, and to learn from you this morning, Lord. And we just pray that you'd bless our time this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. So just a couple quick announcements. Uh, Bible studies are starting up. If you're interested in being involved in any Bible studies, there are a few opportunities that we'll just uh, give you. There's the men's breakfast opportunity, which is every second Friday at 6.30 in the morning. I love that. It's awesome. Yeah, this, this coming Friday, right? This coming Friday, if you're interested in that, we're at Ranchers, 6.30 in the morning. We're studying the book of James. We gather, we eat breakfast together, and we discuss the, the, tie, the, the book of James. If you're interested in that, talk to Dan Dreger. He'd, uh, he's our leader, and he'd be quite happy to, to give you the information and keep you on the, on the email list. Uh, there's also the women's Bible study is starting up. I'm not sure when that's starting, Barb. This Thursday it's starting at 1.30, 1 o'clock on Thursdays at Barb's place. If you're interested in, that's a ladies' Bible study. If you're interested in that, talk to Barb. Uh, she'll give you whatever information you need to know. It's also the Young Adults Bible Study, which I don't qualify for anymore. I don't know why. But uh, the Young Adults Bible Study that goes on Tuesday nights at 7. Uh, and then Daniel, Pastor Daniel is starting one this Wednesday at 7 o'clock at his place. Um, Karen would normally be there with him, but she's leaving him this week, so just temporarily. <laughs> temporarily. I should, I should be careful how I say things, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, Shane. Uh, Karen's going to Penticton to visit her mom this week, so... Wednesday at 7 o'clock at Daniel's place. If you're interested in attending that one, contact Daniel so he's got an idea of who's coming and how many are coming. I asked him what that Bible study will be on, and he said, yep. So he's going to give you some options on Wednesday night when you show up and, and let whoever shows up determine what they want to study. So there's another opportunity for you for that one. If you're interested as well in, in other studies, if you want to lead a study, if you want to host a study, if you feel that you want to open up your home to a study, let Daniel know that as well. 
and we'll try and work on some of those things. Uh, share shop this Tuesday again. We run our share shop ministry every eight days, so it's Tuesday. If you're interested in being involved in that, contact my wife, Karen. Um, I think that's all of the announcements I have at this point. I don't think there's anything else. So I'll invite the worship team, Sheldon and Marie and the rest of the team to come up and lead us in worship. Have you ever made seated for this first one? If that's all right. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside. There's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shake and say, you got change. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out in the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. Well, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain. Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we just thank you that you are all-sufficient, all-knowing, and that you care deeply for each and every one of us, Lord. And we thank you that you are still in charge and you are powerful enough to open the eyes of the blind and you still break chains that hold us back, Lord. And we just pray this continues. We thank you for the freedom here to worship you today. Um, just to come before your throne with, with gladness and, 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 and so much thanksgiving for all you do, Lord. We just, uh, just pray um, these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. And uh, if you want, you can rise with us and um, sing gently. Do we have words yet? Oh, we do. Okay, yeah. Sing along with us. I'm 
told you to seem restrained. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself, carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus beside.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine. I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deep. This valley he will leave. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price it has been paid For Jesus bled He suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and never is my plea Oh, the chains are released I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to him When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. your life for me you 
You stretch your arms out wide. I lift my hands up high, high to my Savior. You stretch your arms out wide. I lift my hands up high, high to my Savior. Oh Lord, I run to the cross, to the Surrender all to my Savior King. Be my everything. You stretched your arms out wide. I lift my hands up high to my Savior. You stretched your arms out wide. I lift my hands up high to my Savior. Chains are broken, shame has fallen, all my sins are gone. Chains are broken, shame has fallen. Stretched your arms out wide, I lift my hands up high to my Savior. You stretched your arms out wide, I lift my hands up high to my Savior. You stretched your arms out wide, I lift my hands up high to my Savior. Stretch your arms out wide. I lift my hands up high to my Savior. Where can I go but to the to the cross? For there my shame you have won. a gift freely given righteousness for the weak sent from heaven with your strength by your grace we stand forgiven we lift high Jesus Christ the name of freedom all we could offer was our filthy rags of Till we received your grace, glorious hope and exchange. Our only boast is the cross, all our hope is Christ in us. You were crucified and raised, and forever we will praise the living God. Living God. From the cross was a gift freely given, righteousness for the weak, sent from heaven your strength by your grace we stand forgiven 
We lift high Jesus Christ, the name of freedom. All we could offer was our filthy rags of shame. Till we received your grace, glorious hope and in Our God is risen. We boast in what you said is done, for it is finished. Our God is risen. We boast in what you said is done, for it is finished. Our God is risen. Our God is risen. cross all our hope is christ in us you were crucified and raised and forever we will praise the living god the living god our only boast is the cross all our hope is christ in us you were crucified and raised and forever we will praise the living God, the living God, the living God, the living God, the living to double check <laughs> I can never remember okay well it's good to see you all here this morning our scripture reading this morning is from second Peter so if you'd turn there uh, in your Bibles that would be absolutely fantastic second Peter and we're going to start right at the beginning second Peter 1 and we'll be reading through uh, verses 1 to 11. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he 
who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing of you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the kingdom, eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. May God bless the reading of his word. I'm going to call the children forward at this time, and Cliff, and uh, he's going to dismiss them. Father God, thank you for these children. Thank you for your love for them. God, we just pray that you would just be with them as they go to their classes this morning, Lord. Just give them the energy, the excitement, the willingness to learn about you. God, be with the teachers. Help them to have patience and just uh, be able to share your word and your love with these kids. Lord, we just thank you for them. We ask your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. I think I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you again for your presence here this morning, Lord, mm. and for the reminder in the songs that we sang of how unworthy we are. Mm. God, all we could do is we could come with our filthy rags, we could come with our chain, we could come with all of that. We could come to the cross, and God, you met us there. And you gave us a hope for eternal life. God, you came in and you gave us that hope. God, we are nothing without you. We, we just, God, we, we, everything we've got, everything we have belongs to you, and you've given us so much. God, you've given us life, and we just thank you for that. We just praise your holy name for, for all that you've done for us, God, for the fact that you gave up your life on the cross so that our sins can be removed from us, so that we can come to you and we can confess our sins. And God, you just wash them away. You just wash them away as if nothing happened, and you redeem us. And God, we have that hope that when the time comes that we pass away, we know we're going to be in, light, in heaven with you. And we'll be spending eternity with you and glorifying your name there. And God, what, a, what, a, what an amazing thought to think that we'll be up there with the angels mm -hmm. and just singing those praises constantly to your name and glorifying you. God, we just thank you for that. God, we just pray that you'd be with our community right now and with our town, with our country. Lord, you know the, the struggles we're going through with this uh, pandemic and the fear that it causes in people's hearts and the, the desire, the, the, the concerns that it causes. God, help us not to put that as our focus. Help us to focus on you. Help us to trust you. Help us to have you walk, walk through us. Walk, walk with us through all of these difficulties that we're facing, Lord. Lord, we know that you are in control, that you know what's going on and that anything, everything that happens is... is for a reason and it's for your glory so god we just pray that you'd give us a confidence give us a peace give us an understanding lord help us to follow the guidelines appro appropriately lord help us to follow the mm -hmm. the rules and regulations but help us not to fear Amen. lord help us to take that fear away lord as we as we look at the different programs that are going lord we just pray that you'd give us the wisdom and direction in them as well lord we thank you for awana we just pray that you'd continue to work through that, Lord, that you'd uh, continue to touch lives in our community, that you'd continue, God, it's usually through children that we can reach out, and, and Lord, when the seeds are planted, it often comes back later in life. And God, we just thank you for that opportunity to be able to share in children's lives, and we just pray that you'd use that program in a mighty way. God, we pray for the Bible studies as well, Lord, we've talked about several of them this morning. God, it's, it's important for us to do. It's important for us to be able to get together in smaller groups so we can be 
accountable to each other. We can talk, we can learn from each other in a lot, in a lot better way in smaller groups than we can in a, in a large setting. So God, it's very important that we gather together in these Bible studies and that we get to know people closer. So God, I just pray that you'd encourage us, that you'd, uh, that you'd encourage the leaders as they lead through these studies, that you'd give them the wisdom and the guidance that they need, and that you'd encourage people to attend, Lord, and that you'd just uh, give us that desire to be part of, a, part of one of those groups, Lord. Lord, we just pray for this church as well and for the, the, the direction that, that we need to go. And we just pray for the elders, for the leadership. God, that you would continue to guide and direct in our lives. That you'd continue to show us where you want this church to go and how we can reach out into mm -hmm. this community and how we can be a part of your ministry in this community. Lord, we just, we just want your direction. We want your help. God, we pray for those that are, that are not feeling well. Lord, we know that there are several that are, that are struggling with, with, with health issues. Lord, we think of John's friend, Steve. Mm. God, we don't know that situation too well, but we know that you are in control of that. And we know that you can do that, that you can touch his life. And we just pray that you'd give him a confidence, a peace, a comfort, that you'd just wrap your loving arms around him as he struggles through this, this disease, Lord, and that your presence would be there, that you'd give John and Holly the wisdom on how to deal and how to how to be able to share your love with this gentleman as well. God, we know that there are several others within our own congregation that are struggling. And we just pray that you would just be there with them as well as they face hurts, as they face uncertainty, as they face issues, Lord, that, that they can turn to you. And we know that you are always the same, God, that you are always there, that you are always there for us whenever we struggle, that we can turn to you with our difficulties, with our ailments, with our problems. And you will walk us through them. And God, that you will often carry us through them, that we can't do it on our own. Mm -hmm. We need you, God. We need you to direct us and to pray us through this. God, we just thank you for this morning. And we just pray that your presence would be here. In your name. Amen. Lord, I, I just want to continue before you, just so full of praise this morning. Um, just for what you mean to us uh, this morning uh, in prayer times and, and in worship time and, and just talking to people. I've seen the joy that can only come from you. Mm. I've seen peace that, I don't, that can only come from you. Lord, I, I, I've seen hope. I've seen tremendous examples of, of, of faith. And, and Lord, we, this all comes from you and we are grateful. Lord, we live in a, in a broken world. We are a broken people. And yet you love us. And so we are so grateful. Thank you, Lord God, for the examples, for the testimonies that I've already seen this morning and to, that just encouraged my heart. Lord, help all of us to just continue to, to walk forward in faith, to, to develop these beautiful traits that only come from knowing you and knowing you closely, Lord God. Lord, we know there's a lot of people hurting in our congregation. Cliff's already prayed this, and oh God, we, some are, are very well-known, some of them are, are lesser well-known issues or, or even private ones. We have so many people who have loved ones, friends who are, are sick, who are, are, are dying, or really struggling uh, with depression. We have people in our own congregation, Lord, that have physical ailments, Lord God, I just pray, first of all, that you would be at work in each one of these situations. Lord, you are not just a, a God of the general, a God of the vague. You are a God of the personal. You are a God who has an intimate acquaintance with us. Lord, I pray that you will take each and every one of these people, speak to their hearts, draw us all to you, give us the strength that we need, give us the grace that we need to deal with these situations, Lord God. So we just, we just lift them up. Uh, to you. Help us, Lord, as a congregation um, just to strive to minister to those around us. Lord, our, our theme from the year is, is community, and um, Lord, you are calling us to love one another, to forgive, to help, to bear burdens, all of these amazing things. Lord, help us to do this in our community, that it would, it would see you, that people would be drawn to you, Lord, that's our prayer. God, we also just, again, want to pray for our congregation that you will keep us safe. Our town has been so blessed with so few cases. 
Uh, and yet we're in a time now with uh, another influx of, of workers. And uh, God, while we, we trust that they are all doing their best to do things safely, um, Lord, we pray that you will just protect us, protect our town, protect us in every way uh, from a, a great breakout, Lord God. We think specifically as a church, Lord, we would ask your protection upon us as we try to introduce ministries again safely. We wouldn't want to see them shut down. Um, Lord, just uh, grant us um, protection. Grant us health. Grant us wisdom and caution. All in the right measures, Lord God. Lord, thank you for being so good. God, go before us this morning. Lord, uh, you know how I sometimes struggle with my words. I, I pray that you will take what it is that you've given me and that you will just amplify it, that you will interpret it to all of our hearts um, for your honor and for your glory, Lord God. We want to see you this morning. Uh, speak mightily, we ask, and we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Like uh, many people, we have some very delightful videos of our children from when they were younger. And, and one of our family favorites, indeed one that gets quoted quite frequently around our house, is from a Christmas when our daughter Emily was two or three years old. We had got her a tricycle for Christmas. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Trikes are not the easiest things to wrap, are they? Right? You know, they're little kids. You don't, you, you don't want to just leave it in the box. It, it needs to be assembled. But how do you wrap that? So me and my, all my pragmatic wisdom, I slapped a bow on that sucker, and we hit it in the kitchen. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where she's going to find it. So we tell her, hey, you've got a present in the kitchen. And then we followed her in there. And, you know, little kids, uh, they get pretty amped at Christmas time, right? They're just excited about absolutely everything. And, and uh, you know, just, ha, ha, ha. And, and so Em walks into the kitchen. She sees this trike. And then with just the most amazing amount of enthusiasm and joy that you could possibly imagine, said, it's just what I always wanted. What is it? She knew it was a great gift, right? Oh, it was, it was awesome. It was something they had to hide in another room even. It was so fantastic. She just had no idea what it was or how to deal with it or what to do next. I was reminded of that. Uh, oh, we're going to have to watch that one again. Uh, that's a classic. Um, <laughs> I was reminded of that story as I was working on uh, this sermon because I was very much struck by the thought that even as believers, we have received, we, and we know we have received this tremendous gift from the Lord, right? We can be just all excited about this tremendous salvation that we have from the Lord, and yet, sometimes we really don't even know what it is. We don't know how it really should affect us. We don't know how to respond. What is our responsibility here? You know, we're excited, but what next? Where should we go from here? This morning we're starting a sermon series in the, the book, The Letter of Second Peter. It, it's not a long book by any stretch, and so hopefully we will get through this by, uh, by the Advent season when our thoughts are, are naturally turned in a slightly different direction. Uh, and just as a, a brief introduction to this letter, it was uh, written by Peter, that uh, great disciple, very, very famous. And, and he was very much a leader in the early church. And, and we knew this uh, was going to be the case because Jesus even said to him in, in Matthew 16 that he was going to build his church upon this rock, upon Peter. Peter was going to be uh, very important. Now, this letter that Peter wrote, it's kind of uh, general in nature. It wasn't just to one specific congregation. And it was really just some common issues that believers of the day 
were facing. It wasn't, you know, with, with some of the letters of Paul, they were a little more pointed, a little more personalized. They were, you know, this is a sin that's going on in this church. Corinthians, get your act together, right? You know, Galatians, who bewitched you? You know, and so this is a little bit more uh, general. I also find it interesting that Peter knew that his days were numbered and that those numbers were getting smaller and smaller. He mentions in, in chapter 1, verse 14, that his death is, is imminent. It's coming quick. And, and so knowing this, we can also get the sense that the things he was saying here were very important to him. He wasn't going to waste time with anything superfluous. He was, these are important matters. These are things I need to tell you. Go even further into chapter 1. And like I'm going to tell you these things over and over. I know I've told you them a lot, but these are super important. He didn't know if he had a tomorrow, so he wasn't going to waste time. This is what you need to know. And so as we take all of that con into consideration, I think we can see this is a really good book for us to study. Even after all this time, this is just good, practical material. So take your Bibles. Hopefully you have your Bible still open and just kind of follow along as we kind of meander our way through the first handful of verses. Now what Peter does here is he gives us this amazing picture of the grace of God. I, I know there's a tendency when we're reading the introduction to one of these letters, you know, greetings and salutations, we have a tendency to just kind of read over them quickly, blah, 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 and then we get to the good stuff, the, the do's and the don'ts. Um, I think that is wrong in so many ways because I think the good stuff very often happens right in the introduction. And, and Peter does that here just uh, beautifully. And, and, and the uh, introduction, the greetings, the salutations just kind of flow naturally into the rest of, of the letter. And it's just so full of hope and it's so full of truth that we can't gloss over it. We can't just skim past this. And, and Peter is presenting here to begin with a beautiful reminder of who God is of what God has done for us, of who we are in him. And, and it's just all beautifully woven together. So let's start by looking at what has God uh, given to us. Well, starting in verse 1, we see that as believers, God has given us the gift of faith. This letter is addressed to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Now, uh, Peter's not talking about a religion here. He's not going, dear people who hold to the same kind of Christianity as us. Baptists, you're good here. Lutherans, Pente Presbyterians, eh. No, he's not saying that, right? It's not got anything to do with any kind of denominationalism or, or, or religion or whatever. Rather, what he's talking about is our ability, actually, just to believe in God. There's a, a beautiful little piece of theology kind of tucked in here that I think we sometimes have a hard time wrapping our heads around. Uh, but it is important for us, to, for us to understand because it really underscores just how lost we are outside of, of Jesus. You know, not only did Jesus accomplish our salvation on the cross, because there was no way that we could accomplish that on our own, but God also gave us the ability to believe in that, the ability to have faith, to be able to accept that truth. That is just how much we were at war with God, how blinded we were to him. It, it, we were just completely blinded to him. And, and so when Peter um, writes about receiving faith, he really means the ability to have faith, the ability to have the scales taken away from uh, our eyes. It's interesting. Even the, the word that Peter, word usage that Peter uh, uses here demonstrates that this was completely an act of God's grace. It's, it, it, it says, you know, this faith which you have received. That word received is a very uncommon word in the Greek. It's only used uh, a few times in the New Testament. And obviously, from secular sources, too, we, we know what it means. And typically, it means someone who has had, who basically, who won the lottery. Somebody 
who won something, who received something by the drawing of lots. And outside of this, every case, every, all the other times we see this word used in the Bible, it's about the soldiers casting lots for Jesus' garments. It's about priests and, and Levites getting drawn for specific duties uh, within the temple and, and so on. And, and it's based on, not on you, not on something that you have earned, but it's based on something that's completely outside of you. And, and so in context, one of the ways this word is used is it's obtaining something by divine will. Like, it's the grace of God. It's got nothing to do with our own merit. The Bible makes an awful lot of references about the fact that we were spiritually dead. It does. We were lost. We were totally and utterly lost. Just as, as somebody who is physically dead doesn't know in this realm that they are dead and obviously can't do anything about it, uh, in the same way, we, outside of Christ, are, were, spiritually dead. We didn't realize it to that extent. We, we had no way of understanding it. And again, there was absolutely nothing that we could do to make any kind of change in that department on our own. We see this throughout the Bible. In Ezekiel, uh, God tells Israel, okay, even though you guys have completely and utterly rejected me, even though you are far, far, far from me, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And then as we come to the New Testament in, in Colossians 2.13, we read, When you were dead in your trespasses and the, or transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. It's God who needs to bring us to life. Because we, our own, we lost in sin cannot do it. We are dead. We are dead. He takes that heart of stone. What a graphic image. Lifeless. Right? Not beating. Just no way of working properly. He takes that out and he puts in a heart of flesh, one that is beating, one that's alive. He is the one who gives us the ability and the desire through his spirit uh, to obey him and, and worship him. John MacArthur, when writing about verse 1 here, tells us, even though faith and belief express the human side of salvation, God still must grant that faith. God initiates faith when the Holy Spirit awakens the dead soul in response to hearing the word of God. So think about that. Even the very faith that we have, the ability to believe, that's a gift of God. That's an absolutely amazing thing to consider. Moving on to verses 2 and 3, we also see that God has given us absolutely everything pertaining to life and godliness. All right, so God has given us faith. Now we see he's given us absolutely everything, everything that we need, whatever it is that we as believers need in order uh, to live life his way, in order to survive in a very broken world, uh, uh, to discover you know, real life in him, and, and to live in a way that pleases him, a way of holiness, a, a godly life. He has also given that to us. He's given us every capability, everything that we need. In verse 2, we read that uh, grace and peace are multiplied to us. They're, they're poured out to us in, in ever-increasing, increasing amounts, not just kind of doled out, but just multiplied to us. Uh, how? It says, by knowing Christ. In verse 3, you know, how do we receive all that we need? Well, that's through the knowledge of Jesus understanding what he said he's 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 all that he's revealed now something that's very important for us to notice here is that in the bible uh, the word know or to know has more than one 
idea behind it. Of course, there is the, the informational aspect, the intellectual, uh, you know, something it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a fact. It's something we, we can read. But, you know, quite often in the Bible, to know also implies a personal relationship, a very, uh, you know, connected thing. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was a way of describing intimacy between a husband and a wife. In, in Genesis 4.1, Adam knew Eve, and then she conceived. Well, I think, our way of thinking, he did more than just know her. You know, I mean, it, there was, it describes an intimacy there, and that's literally the word that is used in the Hebrew. It's yada, and, uh, or yada, but I just like yada better. Um, and it means to know. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read that Jesus knew no sin. Well, obviously, Jesus academically knew what sin was. He wasn't dense, right? He knew what sin was, but he did not know sin. He, he wasn't intimately involved with it by any stretch of the imagination. It wasn't a relationship. He was not, uh, you know, participating in it. And, and so what verses 2 and 3 point to is that we as believers, it is that for us as believers, uh, the way to things like grace and peace and hope and joy and, and all of these other things aren't hidden away from us. They're not impossible for us to find. So many people believe that, but it is so untrue. God has given us the ability. He's provided all that we possibly could need in order to discover these things, in order to, to thrive in these things. And it's all through a relationship with him. He has just poured it on out for us. We have his word, right? God has given us his word. He's given us his Bible. We see that we also have, you know, through the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, God himself living with us. Now we're, we're spiritually alive. And we can have his grace and, and peace. We can know, hey, this is how we're to serve him. He's revealed all of these things to us. Uh, he, he's given us opportunities to communicate, to speak to, and to hear from him. He's given us all that we absolutely need. The Holy Spirit in us, convicting us of our sinfulness. It's all available. And so finding him and finding his, his benefits and, and learning how to walk close to him it is not this impossible task that we on our own have to go and try and figure out, right? It's not a, a secret hidden numerical code in the Bible that we have to stumble across and, and math our way together. It's not. All of this is completely open to us. He has given us the ability to know him. He has given us everything that we possibly could need. I think that's a very comforting thing for us to know, that we're not living in uncertainty. Now, there are a lot of us who, who don't believe that, even, even as believers, right? It's hard to understand sometimes. You know, there are times when God really does feel to be a long ways away, right? We can't feel him. We don't sense his presence in the same way. Does that mean he's gone? Not in the slightest. He's still there. And when we're struggling in life, which I would say is reasonably all the time for most of us, we all have a, a struggle in one area or two, it can often be traced back to us not embracing God in the way that he has revealed to us. Not blaming, I'm just, this is just the way we are. You know, we may let our relationship with him slip from time to time, right? We, we don't walk with him the way that we ought. We, we don't get into his word and allow it to speak to us. This knowledge that he's given us so that we know how to navigate through life. We, we don't live uh, to honor him in all aspects. At times, I think the problem is, is we can slip into ritual and out of relationship with him. You know, we think that... Uh, that pre-meal prayer, that two-minute quick reading through, uh, through some little Bible verse or a little devotional 
uh, is enough. It could be that we've never ever taken the time to discover who our God really is. He's given all this knowledge, it's all out there, but you know, it, 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 we haven't bothered to learn his attributes and to know how he works. We haven't taken the time to, to trust him in, in difficult situations. Um, the reality is that the abundant life that God is promising, all of these great things, it's not dependent on everything in our world being perfect. It's not dependent on external things whatsoever. Uh, just go ask believers in third world countries. Go ask people, believers in some of the most persecuted nations in the world. They have amazing joy and hope. I'm always amazed when I read real things about the church in China. These are people that are so dedicated to the Lord who have that hope, even though everything is horrible. All that we need for salvation, all that we need for intimacy with him, all that we need is to walk closer, to find joy. He has provided to us. That's an amazing gift. One that we don't always know what it is, but take advantage of. And then moving on to verse 4, we discover that God has given us his precious and magnificent promises. And I just love that, the way it's worded. They're not just precious. They're not just beyond you know, great value. They're not just... Oh, so costly. They're also magnificent. It's like this is a little bit of uh, a little bit too much, right? So it's like precious and magnificent. Now, uh, what are these promises that we read about here exactly? Well, the con in the context, we discover that these really are just the, the promises that God has made. Uh, to us, promises that were made in the past that were fulfilled in Jesus, uh, in you know this Messiah who came to to take away the penalty for our sin. Uh, that's a, a big part of it. But not only that, promises for the future that are, are still to be received, such as our reward in heaven when this life is over. And, and what these promises, these these precious and these magnificent uh, promises grant us as new creatures in Jesus Christ is the ability to have a relationship with him and just to taste how good he is. Just a, a bit of a taste of how amazing his ways are even while we live on this planet. And so even while we were dead in our sins, even though God in his justice would have been completely 100% right in immediately condemning us. Out of his grace, he promised to make a way that we could get back to him. That we could be restored to him. And then he faithfully fulfilled that promise. What an amazing gift. And, and so just to summarize these first four verses here of, of, of 2 Peter chapter 1. God made a way for us people who were completely and utterly opposed to him. We were his, his enemies, uh, and he made a way for us to be saved. He gave us the ability then to accept that truth, uh, even though we were completely wired by our sinfulness to not accept that truth, to completely and utterly reject it. And then on top of that, he has given us everything we need for life. And for godliness. That's pretty fantastic, don't you think? That is a part, we shouldn't be just glossing over that. He has given us everything. You know, and I, just that information alone tells us so much about our God. What a wonderful God he is. But you know, as you go through that, I'm sure you've, you've picked out, there's even uh, more revealed about him there. Why did he give us the ability to be able to believe? Because he is righteous, verse 1 tells us. Because he is perfect. He knows what is right. He knows what is good. How is it that he's able to grant us all that it is that we need? Well, it, it tells us by his divine nature. Because he's God. He's all-powerful. He can accomplish this. You know, why has he promised and then fulfilled salvation? Well, verse 3 again. 
because of his own glory and excellence. And so we have this almighty, perfect, omniscient, glorious God of the universe and beyond loving us so much that not only does he want us to have a relationship with him, it makes it possible for us to have a relationship with him. And you know what? This is what our souls have always wanted. That really is truly all that our, our, our souls need. We, we try so often to fill it with other things, don't we? Activities or, or, or you know, wealth or popularity or acceptance or, I mean, just like a million things that we think this is going to make us whole. But, you know, nothing can even come close to this salvation because it's in him and him alone that we find salvation and hope and, and peace. Even while we're here on this planet, that's broken. Even while we're in these shells that are quite broken. Now, Peter's laid all of this out very beautifully. Now we know what it is, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and now he moves on to what our response needs to be. In light of what God has done, what's our responsibility in this matter? And quite simply, he says, we need to live a godly life. We need to live a way that's appropriate for him. God has given us this ability to know him, we read, and then in verse 5 it says, now for this reason also, we need to know him. We need to, to grow in him. And, and Peter underscores just again how important this is with his use of words. Um, I like Peter. He used some very plain words that were just so effective. To begin with, we see that, you know, we need to be applying all diligence. Applying all diligence. The NIV, it's make every effort. It, it really speaks about this is not something to be done haphazardly. This is something to be pursued. This is something to make the priority, the focal point of our lives. Make every effort. Apply all diligence. And, and I kind of have to wonder when, when Peter was writing this, if he thought back to some of those parables of Jesus uh, that, that we see in, in Matthew 13. We have the parable of the, the hidden treasure and the parable uh, of the pearl of great price. Uh, they say, the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, who went and sold everything that he had and bought it. And so Jesus is speaking about just the great value of the kingdom of heaven and, and of knowing God, and how, you know, just like a man on this, you know, here on earth on a, on a physical level, you know, if they were to find something just of great value and they knew it was going to be just the best thing ever. They would do all that they had. They would sell everything. doesn't matter what it is. Put aside all other distractions and go for it. In the same way, we should willing, willingly surrender our lives to the Lord. Cost what it cost in order to obtain this relationship with him. And that's what Peter says here too. He's encouraging his people. Make this effort. Apply all diligent look at what the lord has done look what he has provided for us look what he is still going to provide it would be absolute foolishness not to do such a thing and then we come to the word supply here it's translated supply in the new american standard uh, it's um, translated as add or supplement in some other uh, translations very common translations but you know i find those translations to be misleading they're a little bit I inaccurate I you take the word add for instance right okay you have your faith now you need to add this to it you need to add that to it and it's kind of like uh, you know building blocks right you know we'll just uh, introduce these elements to our faith it doesn't really quite get the message across. Supplement, I think, is a little bit better. 
we have some of these things within our faith, we're just going to add a little bit more, right? That's what supplement means. We're going to just give it a little bit of a boost. Again, not the right idea. The Greek word that, that Peter used meant to supply lavishly and generously to make sure everything was provided in abundance and that absolutely nothing was overlooked. It was really talking about just abundance. John MacArthur writes that the word never meant to equip sparingly. So we're not just to add something. We're not just to supplement something. These weren't, you know, casual uh, things that we could dabble in. It wasn't an a la carte menu that we could pick and choose the bits that, that we wanted. These are the things that we need to be known by as believers. And, and, and so Peter's readers would have understood these verses to mean because of all that God has done for us, our lives need to be focused on him and lived for him above all else, demonstrated by just lavish displays of his attributes in us. Now, I'm not going to go through this list. I know people like it when I explain things, but I'm not going to go through that list one by one and go, this is how you do it. This is how you add to these things. And there's a couple of reasons why. To begin with, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, This is an abridged list that, that Peter used to point us in the right direction. There are so many other things beyond this. We could add to this list the fruit of the Spirit. We could add all of the one another's that we've seen and, and that there are in the Bible. We could add things about sacrifice and service. All of these things, they're all included. And so I don't want to just limit that. And secondly, I think it's important that all, we, all of us as individuals, go through these lists ourselves. How are we doing? You know, I could, I could rab it on about, trust me, I can rab it on. Oh, we know it. Amen. Yeah, I know. We all know this truth, right? But I could, you know, maybe hit four or five of them, but they might not be the things that you're struggling with. They may not be the things that the Holy Spirit is convicting you of. And so today, instead of like going through this list, I'm urging you, I'm challenging you. What are the ways, what are the things that we need to lavishly supply in our lives? What are the things that we're just really not that good at that God calls us to? L loving our neighbor, forgiving somebody. Maybe we're not so good with that, you know, uh, abiding in him thing. Whatever it is, I'm going to challenge us. Go through this list. Go through some of these other lists and 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 see where you're at. I am not going to lie to you because, well, I just tend not to do that. But uh, when I got to this part, when I was writing this sermon, I just felt overwhelmingly convicted. Uh, it's bad. You know, God has given us so much, right? You see those things that God has given us? And then it's like, man, I am such a poor reflection of him. That's just the reality. Uh, mercifully, it's uh, the blood of Christ that counts in the end and not my ability to be perfect. But that doesn't change our need to strive for these things. And as difficult as this calling is on our life, uh, this lavish development of, of godliness and, and, and these characteristics and attributes, we see even more that as we do these things, as we obey, God's grace is poured out. It's amazing to begin with, but we find even more. Verse 8, if you'll drop down to verse 8, it says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we grow in him, as we develop our relationship with him, where we know him both yeah, who he is, but also intimately on a personal uh, way, he blesses us. Our efforts aren't in vain. We're not fruitless. We're not useless. He draws us closer. He reveals even more about himself to us. And, and he uses us in ways that we can see. And he uses us in ways that we can't even begin to imagine in ministering to people. 
in drawing people to him, in encouraging one another. He's doing in and through us things that will have an eternal impact, which I just find to be just so thrilling (laughs) that he could use us to do these kinds of things that will bring him honor and glory. Dropping down to the end of, of verse 10, we also see that this will keep us from stumbling. There's a couple ways we can understand this benefit. On the one hand, you know, growth in the Lord does keep us from falling into certain sins, from wrecking our lives, breaking relationships, doing all sorts of other, you know, things that, that are going to hurt us, discourage us, limit our usefulness kind of thing. You know, we're believers, but we struggle in the Lord, and, and so we kind of stumble. But beyond that, in, in, in verses 9 through 11, we see that our desire to live for this, live for God in this way, is also evidence of a genuine faith. That's what we read there. Our, our diligent obedience means that, that we're on the right track, that we're not going to stumble, we're not going to fall away, that we can be assured of our salvation. However, on the other hand, if we're not, we read in verse 9, he who lacks these qualities, he who lacks this desire to serve God in this way and to to love him with all that we are, is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. And and being blind, I think we all know, um, yeah, very common in the Bible in speaking about unbelievers, a, a very common metaphor. And, and the, the reference then to short-sighted, well, we might go, okay, there's two ways of understanding that. It could be, okay, somebody who's a believer but just doesn't see the big picture. But in the Greek, it actually stands for willfully blind. It's somebody who has closed their eyes. And that's a, a horrible, horrible thing. And so, you know, we can be exuberant about God and all these things that he's done for us. We can say all the right words, but you know, if our heart doesn't have that desire to grow, if our heart doesn't have the desire to serve and obey him, do we really understand what it means to be saved? Growing in him, in our faith, and our godliness, and our knowledge is evidence of being on the right path that keeps us from stumbling. Not growing in these ways being blind, being short-sighted, being forgetful. Even if we're a believer, will lead us into, it will lead us into stumbling. Because it leads us into fear and despair, a lack of assurance of our salvation. Or, if we're not saved, even though we think we might be, we'll stumble our way into an eternity in the presence of the wrath of God, rather than in the presence of the love of God. This beautiful gift of grace that God has has given to us is truly what we've always wanted. Do we know what it is? It's life. It's hope. It's, It's our salvation. It's peace and joy. It's a call to live for the one who just pours this out onto us. kind of like the first part of that, don't we? I think, some, you know, we kind of wish I would have stopped with life and, and peace and joy and hope and salvation because we don't like that second part. We don't like the, we don't always like the responsibility. And yet as we carry out that responsibility, the gift becomes even greater. And so I just really want to challenge all of us this morning just to take some time to consider this passage. What is it saying to us? What have we seen this morning? Do we truly worship God and just marvel at who he is and his grace and this amazing gift uh, that he has given to us, what he's done for us. You know, while we were yet sinners, while we were complete and utter enemies, he died for us. What we were spiritually dead, he made us spiritually alive. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And the more we grasp that fact, the more we should be making an effort to live in this way of godliness, to follow along this path. Not saying it's going to be easy. 
Uh, guess what? It's not. If you go through that list in uh, verses 5 to 7 there, it's like, uh, oh, brotherly kindness. Some people are going, where is that nonsense? You know, we can go, godliness, oh, that sounds boring, right? These things aren't easy. Some of these things are a huge stretch. Uh, to grow in them is not something we can do in our own power. These are things that we need the Holy Spirit to help us in, to guide us in. We need his strength. And I'm going to give you one more truth. We're never going to get it right this side of eternity. We're not going to be perfect. But because of wh who he is and what he has done, this is an assignment that we need to take on diligently each and every day. So let's just all take some time today, tomorrow, whenever, to go through this passage to examine our own lives. Let's just close in a word of prayer. Lord, um, thank you uh, so much for who you are. Uh, we, we just, oh, we just don't even have a clue. You've revealed so much to us, all that we need, and yet we do not understand your vastness. We cannot, we struggle to, to, to understand the, the extent of your grace, your love for us. Mm, you are such a great God, and, and we just worship you. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for making that possible. And thank you just for giving us your knowledge that we can live for you. God, help each and every one of us. Lord, this is a message we don't always like because it's like, uh, got to change. And yet, Lord, this is your truth. And so we, we, we bless you for that. Lord, help us to, to each individually just seek out a few areas. Not just supplement what we have, but to provide them lavishly, generously. Lord, help us to encourage one another in these things. Lord, help us just to, to look into your word and, and, and see how we are to do these things. Lord, just guide us, we pray. Lord, we want to serve you. We are so grateful for your salvation. Where would we be without you? Help us, Lord, just to respond properly. God, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time. Thanks for us as a group. Um, you're, you're just too good to us. Bless us, we pray, and I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team. cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crushed your son drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin Jesus thank you Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. By your perfect sacrifice, I be brought me. of your glorious grace your mercy and your kindness shall no end your blood 
has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Love Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank Thank you for coming. It's good to see you all. Great joy. We have such a great God, and um, it's great that we can just get together and to worship him uh, as a group and to just learn together. If there's anything we can do, please let us know. We're always here. We're more than willing to pray and to encourage and just to do whatever we can, so just let us know. Uh, Other than that, by way of uh, a benediction, the last verse, which we'll hear more than once from, uh, of 2 Peter would be my prayer for you. I pray that we would all grow uh, just in the knowledge and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless. We are dismissed. your day.